very much. Breaking news then in the last 10 minutes, wheelchair user Doug Pawley has partially won his case at the Supreme Court against a bus operator after he tried to get on a bus but couldn't because a buggy was in the way. The court decided that non-disabled people occupying a wheelchair space can't be forced to move by law but said bus drivers must do much more to try to sort the problem out. Let's talk to four people who say their disability has meant they have struggled with getting on various elements of public transport. Will Pike uh, had an incident just this week on a bus where the ramp facilities weren't working. Romina Puma, like Doug Pawley, has been refused bus rides in the past because of push chairs in the disabled space. Zoe Williams says one in ten trips on public transport feel like a challenge for her. And Samantha Renk says every day feels like a tube strike for her. Goodness me. Okay, let's talk about the what's happened at the Supreme Court first of all. Your reaction that that bus drivers are going to that they have to do a little bit more than request that someone moves the buggy from the wheelchair space, which might mean finding another space for it or or shaming the person that won't move the buggy. What do you think of this, Zoe? Um, I think the whole point of this case was to try and get a little bit more clarity about how far bus drivers are meant to go in mm. terms of requiring people to move out of the space. I'm not sure this ruling has actually provided that clarity. I certainly found well, that... Well, you're smiling and you're... <laughs> you, you, you're go on, Will. No, no, no I, I, sorry, I mean, continue. I mean, I think she's absolutely hit the nail on the head. We were seeking some sort of clarity. Doug's done an incredible job in terms of bringing this issue to light and um, to the mainstream media's attention. And at the end of it, there's no news, essentially. It's kind of back to square one which is people are probably going to be searching for some sort of grey area of truth in this. Mm. Um, and I mean, can you envisage, Samantha, being on a bus, where, a bus now where we've got this, this, whatever this is, this judgment, this ruling, and there's a buggy there, what happens? Um, I mean, I, I normally ask the buggy to move. Mm. That's not always a bit awkward. I've never once had a bus driver get out and physically come to the area and ask for that to be moved. So it's normally um, myself or somebody who, who I'm with. Mm. Um, and that can just be a bit awkward because particularly when it's a full bus, you know, it's been raining outside, but I need to get on that bus because like everyone else, I've got a job and I, I got to go places. Mm. I can't just wait outside for three or four buses. And that has actually happened. Mm. I've been waiting for several buses. Yeah. I mean, Clive Coleman was suggesting, Romina, that, you know, the bus driver will, will sort of call out the, the, the parent who's got the buggy in the wheelchair space and try and shame them in some way. Is that going to work? No, it's not going to work because it happened in the past. I mean, when they ask the, the moms or the parents to, to fold up the, the, the prompts, they, they say, no, I'm not going to do it. And they, they look at me, the driver looks at me and says, oh, he doesn't want to do it. What can I do? Mm. So, well, uh, I need to go on the bus too. He can fold up the, the prom, mm. I can't, mm. it's, it's just uh, a priority and also all those signs there, uh, priority wheelchairs, it's just like, it's like a, a, an ornament, decoration. <laughs> Just a gesture. To, yeah, <laughs> just just get rid of them. Put some adverts instead. It's just misleading. Mm. I don't I don't think it's fair. Empty threat, uh, empty threat really. Mm. You know. So um, why can't there be a penalty? I was recently on um, a train with the same scenario where I couldn't get to a wheelchair space, and people left their baggage um, all over. Mm. The sign said priority by law. If it's by law, why aren't um, why isn't the law being enforced? Mm. So Why are people putting their stuff there? Exactly. Why mm -hmm. do you think? Um, I think attitude towards disability needs to really change. I think. Do you think there hasn't been much progress? I think I think there has mm -hmm. in some areas, but people still don't realise that we are pretty much like everyone else. We have again, we've got jobs, we've got places to be. Um, you know, we're not going to just sit at home, and that's where people need to change their mentality, that disabled people should be thought of as integral parts of the community, and n not someone that is, you know, kind of sitting at home and feeling sorry for themselves, because that, that is completely not the case. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the ramp incident, Will. Yeah, I mean, actually, it wasn't within the last week, but um, no, it, we, were, we were talking about this in the green room before, and um, I think all of us have had a situation whereby um, 
uh, the, the ramp has, has broken. I mean, I've cleared a bus um, load of passengers on a Monday morning rush hour. And I think what that sort of taps into for me is the amount of sort of confidence and um, mental, emotional strength sometimes it takes just to leave the house and, and, and accomplish things that would be uh, quite straightforward um, for able-bodied people. And it's just that lack of empathy sometimes and humanity within a situation that means you're left with a type of conflict and altercation that nobody really wants to have. And I think with, with Doug's case, it's, it's an example of how far people are prepared to take it, but he's not saying everybody should go down this path, mm. because clearly four years is far too long for anything like this to, to take as a process. And, and in the end, it's actually, um, the, the outcome has probably undermined a lot of the work that he's, taken, mm. he's, he's, he's been doing. And, and certain charities like Scope who've been supporting um, Doug's case are probably left now kind of going, well, where does this leave us? Because yeah. we had a response. And, and, and bus operators will be thinking, where so, does this yeah. leave us? Yeah. Yeah. Zoe, I mean, so what, we, what it seems we're talking about here is not only a, 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 cha a shift in the minds of, no, of uh, able-bodied people, but also still it's clear facilities which are supposed to be there for people using wheelchairs are not, mm. or if they are, they're not functioning properly. Yeah, I think that's true. I think um, if you look at the design of most public transport, it's not designed with wheelchair users particularly in mind. Mm. There's provision made for wheelchair users within a design that's primarily aimed at non-wheelchair users. So you're always going to be a little bit of an afterthought, a little bit of an add-on, whereas you know, a, a, a better design would be one that actually takes, takes the idea that wheelchair users do need to use this facility and, and, and adopts that into the central part of the design mm. rather than you know, putting a space in afterwards. On trains, for example, you know, there's, there's not enough space for luggage and wheelchairs. No. And so luggage tends to take priority because more people have luggage, but it doesn't have to be that way. If there was more space for luggage and wheelchairs, then we wouldn't have this conflict if there was more space on buses for wheelchairs and pushchairs, as there are in some bus designs that I've come across. Mm. Yeah. Then you get much less, much less of a problem with that. Let me read some comments from people watching you talk about this from around the country. They're not all sympathetic. They're not rude or anything, but they're not all no, sympathetic. Okay. They're, not, they're probably from mum's net. But <laughs> <laughs> well, there is there's Iris here. I'm a mum of three who tries to use as much public transport as possible instead of using our car. I think the question is not whether a wheelchair user should always have the right to get a space on a bus. If there is a parent with one child, then of course they can collapse the buggy and hold their child. But what about a mum with a toddler and a newborn? How is she supposed to have both on her lap and lift a heavy pram into a storage rack? Why are you shaking? Because, Why are I mean, you... The, but, but, what, what's she kind of trying to do with this particular comment? Sort of generate um, some sort of sympathy towards her plight? Yeah, OK, we get it. Like, that particular journey might become difficult for you. And what we're, what we're saying is that there, there are probably countless journeys where these interactions take place, and they're probably handled quite, you know, with, with sensibly. civility and sensibly. Yeah. Um, this type of um, debate, the buggies via we, the wheelchair shorthand actually doesn't help anything. It's okay. not about these two people. Let me read this. I cannot, in all honesty, see why an adult in a wheelchair has any more right to use the space provided. <laughs> Because they campaigned for the priority space. Mm -hmm. If buggies and wheel mum mums with wheelchair and um, buggies didn't campaign to create wheelchair spaces within public transport, okay. people with wheelchairs did. And All bear right. in mind as well, the wheelchair space is the only place where a wheelchair user <laughs> can safely yeah. travel on a bus. The only. And I, I mean, to, in, in response to Iris's comment, I was actually on a bus last week with a mother and, t and two very young children. Mm. And other passengers on the bus helped her fold yeah. the buggy up, mm. helped her arrange the children in a way that was was safe. And mm. and. I found generally 95% of the time people people on the bus are very helpful and yeah. will see if someone's in difficulty and will help out. But and it, it is it is a pain to have to rely on the goodwill of others, and I understand that. But we have to rely on the goodwill of others 100% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, John emails you know, this. People need to take their turns. Go on, Samantha. And then no, I, I think what what I found really heartbreaking with my story coming out um, about the trains and, and now today with this, I get messages, I get tweets from a number of people with different impairments and they say, this is why I don't go on public transport. This is why I'm too scared. Mm. Now, being disabled can be isolating mm. enough yeah. without um, thinking, oh my goodness, I don't even want to get on a bus mm. to go and do my shopping. I think that's mm. really, really sad and I think that's what we need to look at. I mean, if, to, be, to be terrified or uh, put off to just get on a bus, which you know, everybody takes for granted every day. Mm. Yeah. Uh, John says this, enforcing disabled spaces on buses is easy. Just stop the bus until the selfish person complies, uh, either out of shame, impatience or peer pressure from other passengers. 
Brilliant. Turn the engine, driver, <laughs> the driver turns the engine off and says, right, we're not going anywhere until you move. <laughs> but sometimes, Someone's going to do that. Yeah, well, once one of the, the things that happened to me was I, I was with the scooter here mm. and it was, it was late at night, I was tired, it was raining, it was cold, I just wanted to go home. And the driver didn't let me on the bus because uh, said that this scooter here wasn't in the specification to be allowed on a bus. So it was too big. It wasn't, Which, right, no, okay, it, too big. it is. The wrong I, measurements. I checked three times. Mm -hmm. So it's, I it's, was super sure okay. that this can go on. Mm. So I was thinking, I should go just in front of the bus and stop the bus. <laughs> <laughs> what but stopped I didn't. you taking that no, action? No, I didn't because it, the, there was no slope to go down. Okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. But in the end, what I did, she didn't let me on, but I managed to catch the following one, mm. which was faster than, than the first one. So I got to my stop and I waited for her and I knocked. And I wanted the, the details to do like a complaint. But she didn't open the, the door, she just <gasps> went up. Wow. Yeah, no, that was the, the worst experience okay. ever. Right, I can see Clive Coleman has hot-footed it to outside of the Supreme Court to fill us in about this partial judgment, uh, Clive, which we've been reacting to in the studio with our guests here. Absolutely. Well, a partial victory, I think, is probably a better way to describe it because uh, this, this battle by Doug Pawley, this legal battle, which started when he simply tried to get on a bus in 2012 to go from Weatherby to Leeds, uh, and there was a policy on the, that the bus operator used at the time, which was to request, but not to require, a, a non-wheelchair user to vacate the wheelchair space. That policy has been at the centre of this legal battle. Doug Pawley initially won a victory that that policy amounted to unlawful disability discrimination. That was reversed by the Court of Appeal. It's come to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court today have ruled that that policy of requesting uh, that someone move from that space doesn't go far enough. Uh, Doug Pawley has won a victory. That means that bus companies simply will have to do more. We'll talk about exactly what they have to do by way of further action in a moment. But first of all, let's talk to Doug. Doug, uh, five years. Uh, you just tried to get on a bus in 2012. Now you're at the Supreme Court and you've won a victory. Yes, who would have thought that five years on, I would still be discussing that day that I had that problem going across to see my parents for lunch, you know? Um, I was going across to see my mum and dad, who was an hour late. My mum and dad have been at every hearing since. Said they, mum very sadly died last summer and didn't get to see the end of this. Five years. Uh, I'm sure she's with me all the way. It's, it's just been amazing, the amount of support that I've had of so many people, disabled people, organised organizations, lawyers, family, allies, and, you know, this, this hopefully is going to make a major difference to disabled people's travel. It's brilliant. Well, let's just unpick it a little bit, because yeah. perhaps it didn't go quite as far as you had wanted. What it seems to me, reading the judgment, that what is being said is that, you know, drivers now will have to sort of put some pressure on the person who's within that space to move. They can't physically move them. Uh, it's that there's no legal duty, uh, which means that operators have the right, really, to remove somebody, to kick them out of that space, but they've got to do more than they currently do. Well, not all the justices agreed, actually. There was at least one justice that said that there was the power to do that. Um, so there was a significant disagreement on some details. But in any case, you know, it, these things are always a matter of judgment. Drivers have to judge whether how to react to somebody smoking or causing a disturbance or eating smelly foods, the famous kebab that's appeared in every hearing. Um, so they, there's already always got to be some judgment and there will always be some exceptional circumstances where somebody can't be expected to move out of the space. But what this means, what this judgment means, is that the driver has to make their own decision as to whether or not the person is being unreasonable in refusing to move. And if they are, he or she has to tell them that they are required to move and, if necessary, refuse to move the bus until um, they shift. So that's fairly clear, I think. OK. Let's talk to Chris Fry, your solicitor, who's been fighting this case right the way through uh, the entire English legal system, the every, yeah. just about every court. Um, 
Chris, just to explain, some people will think that this is actually going to cause more confusion because drivers perhaps won't know how to put pressure or how much pressure to put on somebody to move. And actually, you could be in a somewhat worse position than you were before. I think it's difficult to see how it could be worse for anybody. I mean, this is, uh, this is fairly clear judgment from the Supreme Court that uh, the policy of request and retreat, so just a driver asking someone to move and then washing their hands of it, is now an, uh, an, a dead policy. Uh, bus companies should now be operating the, the, to the Pauli principle, which is that disabled passengers now have... Doug, you've got a, a principle named after you now, the Pauli <laughs> principle. Are you happy about that? <laughs> it, it, cool. It's quite a, a name, isn't it? No, <laughs> there's so many people who've done so much to make this happen. This isn't me that's done it on my own, so I don't know. Let, it, let's it, get Chris Fry to explain in detail what is the oh, Pauli principle. Yeah, the, the Pauli principle is fairly straightforward. If you're a disabled passenger, you have enforceable priority rights over that wheelchair space. The Supreme Court agreed uh, unanimously that... Uh, that was the case. Um, where the judgment falls short uh, and where clearly there was a dispute between uh, three of the Supremes in particular thinking that the judgment should have gone further was that uh, there's no right uh, as things currently stand to, to, to force someone off a bus. And so it goes as far as that but not that far yet. Yet because we know that Parliament has been looking at the outcome of the case and is looking at legislating to give clarity over those additional rights. So Doug Doug's changed, he's changed everything for disabled passengers. Uh, he's changed the culture, and it looks as though the decision in fullness of time will actually achieve the full change that we're looking for. Let's just have a quick word with Robin Allen QC, who's been uh, your barrister, Doug, throughout this legal battle. Robin, how far do you think this principle extends in terms of service providers, talking about disabled parking spaces in supermarkets, disabled toilets on trains? Uh, what are service providers going to have to do now in terms of looking at their policies? Well, they've got to take on board that the Equality Act has this principle of reasonable adjustment, and that means that they must try and give equal access to their services to disabled people. That's why we have disabled car parking spaces close to the door of a supermarket, uh, why they're wider so that doors can be opened and so on. And they should have a policy to prevent people blocking those spaces, and they'll need to think how they do it. So they might need a parking attendant or somebody in a supermarket who's willing to go out and say, oi, not in that space, move over. And to put some serious moral pressure onto the ordinary walking public or the able-bodied public to ensure that the disabled public have equal access to goods, facilities and services. Doug, um, a final thought from you. Uh, I know that you spoke about your, your, your mother had followed this process right the way through. She wasn't here to see it, but she, uh, will, if she will know now, well, wherever she is, that the Pauli principle has been well and truly established. <laughs> yeah, she was a wonderful lady. I've had such support of wonderful parents. I am incredibly lucky. Few people have that. And, um, yeah, God bless you, Mum. I think you owe them lunch now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, um, Victoria, there you have it. The, uh, the Pauli principle has been established today here uh, at the Supreme Court, and it really is a wake-up call for service providers around the country that they really will have to look at their policies in relation to wheelchair users and to make sure that those policies are sound and that they're properly enforced. Back thank to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Clive. Um, worth saying to Romina, Will, Samantha and Zoe, actually, Doug Pauli was, was, was a lot more positive and optimistic than perhaps we initially were. You initially were, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. I so. yeah. yeah, yeah, he's quite positive. I, I'm still not so positive. I, really? I want to see what uh, what uh, what changes they're going to yeah. make. And like even with muscular dystrophy UK, we do uh, a campaign called End the Line, and we work along with TfL. So we're very happy to to work with them uh, even more to make them understand what we really need. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you for coming on the programme. Nice to meet you, Zoe, Samantha, Will. Good to see you again. Romina, good, good to see you as well. You. Thank you. Thank you.